All right, what's up, guys? Uh, episode 15, The Blacklist of Voice. Uh, Logan and Matt are here with uh, myself, um, and we are going to kind of break down uh, a competitor's mindset today. Um, Logan and I had listened to a podcast with by uh, Steve Magnus, and I can't remember the other guy's name on there, um, but they kind of did a deep dive um, into a runner's mindset and kind of some successes that they've seen um, transfer over from um, their coaching to the to their athletes running um, success. So we decided we just kind of want to chat a little bit more about that and give a little bit of kind of like a deeper dive into that for um, competitive CrossFitters. So um, first off, we're just going to start off with just kind of defining um, – what we feel is a competitor's mindset and um, what uh, what that kind of means to us, if that makes sense. So uh, do you guys have any uh, definitions on that? Yeah. So for me, like uh, a true competitor or a competitor's mindset is someone that is able to express their trained ability the most in competition. So what I mean by that is there's typically about three, ty three types of athletes, I would say. Uh, one that trains at the same, same level that they compete at. Um, another one that trains, um, they actually train better than what they compete at. And then the third is someone that competes better than where they train. And I, for me, that is a true uh, competitor. The one that kind of brings it all together because that's really – uh, what competing is to me. Um, and yeah. if, if it had to do with raw ability, then we want to play the game. Simply put, if it was just about who has better, um, who has better deadlift, clean, snatch, jerk, um, who can do Fran the fastest, then we wouldn't even have to um, have a competition. So at the end of the day, it's the one that is able to express uh, their trained ability uh, within, within their competition or, or their given sport. Yeah, it's almost like rising above what their ability level is out on the floor type thing. Correct. Cor correct. Or just um, simply being able to perform more consistently and not letting outside stimuluses negatively affect their performance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, do you have a do you have a definition? Um, I I think that hits it pretty good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, to caveat off of that, Logan, like, um, there's kind of levels to everything. And I, I think people start to get confused with, um, you know, I, to be a competitor, I need to be competing at the highest level. But again, there's kind of levels to everything. So whatever your ability level is, you know, whether that's like a scaled competition, RX competition, yeah. elite competition is you're competing at your given talents. Right. inside of that kind of like level um, right. of wherever you're at. So right. just to like put that in a frame of reference is like, you don't need to be an elite athlete to have a competitor's mindset. It's very much like within whatever, uh, within the realm of whatever you're capable of is, is there are just like certain characteristics that you're going to start to develop um, Absolutely. becoming a competitor. Absolutely. Um, and so one of the, one of the big things um, th that, that they had mentioned in the podcast that I think holds true for, for CrossFit more so than even running as a sport is they, they talked about um, being in the hunt and always being in the hunt. Um, and so their kind of training philosophy is to every day uh, you're doing um, whatever it takes or whatever race you're in, you're, 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 in the hunt for that race, you know, top three, or you have the ability to make a move, but you know, maybe you didn't that day for whatever reason. Um, and that's kind of like where we want to be with CrossFit is you're always in the hunt to take that podium spot or be inside of that top 10 or be inside of, um, you know, whatever that next qualification process is, or, um, you know, making, making money inside the sport, if that's, if that's kind of what your goal is. Um, but that was kind of like a, a, uh, thing that hit home uh, pretty hard because there's a lot of different um, variances inside of CrossFit uh, or a lot of different mo modalities inside of CrossFit. And we're not all going to be great at all of them, but you can definitely get good enough to be in the hunt on 
running, gymnastics, weightlifting, whatever it is, and keep yourself competitive inside of whatever competition you're doing. Um, yeah. And so that was kind of my takeaway from that. I don't know if, if you had some other ones or you have thoughts on that, Matt, or. Um, so when, when you said um, in the hunt within training, um, what, uh, and then, and then you were talking about specific, like in, and then treating it in competitions. Are you talking about training competitions or like just day-to-day -day training? I yeah. Clear, yeah. Clarify that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's more like, sorry, in the hunt is more for, um, you know, is more for competition, but you want to be showing okay. up day in and day out, making sure you're doing the stuff to keep you inside of the hunt, inside of competition. I think that's where I was trying to go with that one. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, the only thing I would add, add with that is um, I would say that, that there's also a maturity with being in the hunt and that's, not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean doing exactly what's written every single time that also requires that maturity to listen to your body and be like yeah all right i want to be in the the hunt day in and day out so i need to go a little bit easier this day just listening to my body so that i can consistently be in that hunt yeah yeah you and i are definitely experiencing that being on the back ends of our fitness ability <laughs> <laughs> so uh logan do you have any thoughts on that or yeah, man. So when, when I first like heard the in the hunt or, you know, that, that phrase, uh, what came to mind to me is just, I think obsession, obsessive, um, preparation. And what that means to me is like both, you know, in training and then for the preparation of the actual competition. And like what I just said, when we were talking about, uh, being a competitor, being a competitor means you are consistent. And when, you know, so meaning in the hunt when you're in a competition, like if that guy in front of you that might have, you know, maybe more talented, um, you know, you know, maybe stronger, bigger, faster, when he slips up, you're right there. You're right there in the hunt. You're ready. You know, if someone uh, has a little dip that day, you're right there. And I just think it's just preparation and just being so, so consistent. Um, yeah. And the ones that, um, you know, that aren't, you know, in the hunt or those ones that all the, you know, the stars have to align and they have to be feeling perfect and, um, you know, everything of that nature uh, for them to do well, those are the guys that you're going to be able to beat. So I think, you know, just, you know, obsessive preparation um, and really showing up um, for training, no matter the circumstances. And now I don't mean, you know, if your body's, you know, really, really beat up and you need to, need to take a break, then like, you know, keep pushing through it and no, that's not what I mean but as far as you know, mentally or you know you had a bad day at work where you're having um you know any kind of outside stress or it's hot or any of those outside stimuluses you don't let those affect you um and I think that's what makes you be able to be in the hunt because whenever you're in the competition especially especially in CrossFit um there's so many uh variables and yeah. if you if you think for one second that a four-day competition is going to go exactly how you planned and all the variables are going to be perfect, then, you know, you're very, very wrong. So I think it's just being extremely prepared. Um, and to me, it's just not, you know, taking extreme ownership for everything that you do in training and prepping for competition. And that just mindset is going to uh, boil over to actually competing on the floor. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, definitely kind of like, uh, being resilient inside of those competitions as well. Um, Absolutely. Four day comps, like, man, it is just up and down. Like our, in 2014, our games experience, we were, I think we started out the first day in like fourth place. We had like two people that drug our team through freaking thousand yards of ocean swims. <laughs> and <laughs> like, um, I think maybe in like the second day we like were floating around 10 to 20th place. I think we ended up in like the second heat. And by the end, we ended up, uh, we ended up winning the last workout and finishing two points away from a podium spot coming from like starting the last workout in 10th place. So it's just like, wow. uh, uh, that's like, uh, one thing I try and remind people like is no matter what in a CrossFit competition, like you need to like give it 100% all the time. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen. Um, yeah. I think Frazier's regional performance in that, I was like 2017, um, maybe it was 2018, but 
like he just destroyed everybody on every single workout and it's like that is like that is in the hunt like even though he's winning by like 50 60 points he's still going out there and making sure that he's putting forth his best effort and i'm sure like you can see it with some people uh rich froning's last games experience um with some of the behind the scenes footage he was you know really down in the dumps um after i think it was like day two and he wasn't in like his normal like striking position of like seventh place or third place whatever it was and he was pretty down but he was still able to recognize that and still push and give himself a good effort to continue to go on and and win the games and um to me that's kind of like a more in the hunt type mentality is like no matter where you're at in the performance you're still pushing yourself to give yourself 100 percent effort inside of the competition yeah yeah just keep showing up yeah no yeah what. yep <laughs> yep uh, yeah, so the uh, the other point that was kind of um, – we kind of grasped a hold of was uh, raise the floor instead of reaching for the ceiling is, is uh, one thing they were talking about. And I think uh, inadvertently for me, that's just some um, – my coaching style. Um, I tend to – I tend to try and find whatever your weaknesses are, or your biggest weakness at the time, and try and push that and elevate that as close as possible to whatever your strengths are in the sport. Um, for running, obviously, that's a little bit more simple because you have, uh, for most runners, like one modality that you're training. Uh, in CrossFit, it makes it a little bit difficult because there's several oh, thousands of things that you're working on at one time. But um, that's uh, – that is kind of like my, yeah, where, where I, I kind of come from in training. Yeah. Um, and one thing I don't do a great job of explaining to some of my athletes is, is when we do testers, um, not all the time you guys are going to be feeling fresh in your testers because I want to see if you guys can bring it and come close to what your old ability level was, not feeling as fresh as, as you might have felt um, previously uh, or being peaked for a, for a tester. Um, and I think that says a little bit more to your ability level. If you're able to, you know, PR by a a second, two seconds, a rep going into a workout, not feeling your best. Um, because we know when we do peak you and we do deload you and, and get you ready for a competition, you're going to absolutely blow that out of the water. Um, so I think that's like something that I'm working to communicate with some of my athletes a little bit better is, uh, you know, we're working to raise the floor and raise whatever it was on your worst day is now like you're better than uh, where you were on your best day previously. So that was like my kind of thought process or takeaway from, from that point. If you guys have anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm definitely there with you uh, just as far as, um, just being able to like raising the floor to me is being more consistent with um, more consistent with good performances within training. And I would say in competitions um, as well. So like you said, like your, um, your old 100% on a workout um, is now like maybe an 85% or, you know, I remember when you, we did a ton of 17.1 intervals and we retested it and I, think I got like maybe 20 seconds slower than when I repeated it, but I did get, to, I think like 30 seconds faster than the first time I did it when I did the open. And, you know, I definitely wasn't peaked and I think it was like a hundred degrees and I get super hot and it definitely <laughs> yeah. wasn't ideal circumstances, but I knew that, um, I was a, I knew that I improved. And I think that goes to show like, uh, we, we, me and you, me, you and I also had the same conversation, um, as far as like with qualifiers, and I kind of made the statement as like, I can consistently put up, um, you know, good, uh, good scores within a qualifier and not be peaked for it. Cause I think we were running through a water a qualifier and I actually wasn't doing it. We we're just kind of testing it out. And mm-hmm. I was able to hit, you know, pretty good scores that, yeah. you know, not a peaked condition. And you kind of made the comments like, you know, that's really where the people that do well in the sport, that's what they're able to do. They're able to continually, or consistently do well, even when they're not, you know, peaked for it. Because I mean, like we said, you're not going to be a hundred percent at a four day competition by the end. So if you're able to, you know, with 
a competition like that, it's sometimes by the end, it's like who drops off the least amount. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, it's just, you know, being able to train more consistently at a competitive level. And it doesn't necessarily mean like grinding your – uh, grinding your face into the dirt every single training session, but um, realizing that, you know, there's times to push, there's times to step back, but you're consistently giving it the effort that, you know, you and your, your coach, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, design of the workout is. Yeah, for sure. Do you have any thoughts on that matter? I, I think another benefit of raising the floor is it just it makes you more complete as an athlete. So you're going to be more durable. You're going to be able to be more consistent because you're going to be less prone to injury. So just yeah, that that building that base not not only is it going to help you be a better athlete, but it's going to help you more, be more consistent so that you can put in more training. For sure, for sure. You're kind of going through that right now with some of your training, right? Yeah. <laughs> what oh, yeah. does that look like <laughs> uh lots and lots of intervals and strict work and yeah. intervals on the machine <laughs> what give a give an example of one of your training sessions right now uh so yesterday yesterday i uh i did 35 every 35 seconds three strict pull-ups and a um calorie ski for 60 sets fun fact the ski erg only does 30, 50 intervals and then it snaps out. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> broke it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know it was like that. <laughs> I know. I I was very unhappy when it was like hitting the max and I'm like, I have 10 more intervals. <laughs> <laughs> well, time to restart here. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's sweet. Um yeah, I mean, it definitely, like, it's going to look different for everybody. Um, and, like, you know, Matt and I actually chatted about this uh, yesterday a little bit. Um, you know, he's able to just grind and put in kind of like this literally 60 intervals of three strict pull-ups and skier um, every 45 seconds. How, how long is that, Matt? Was that, like, 30 minutes? Uh, so it, it was every it, – well, it was every 30 – uh, five seconds. So I think it took 36 minutes or so, but okay. I've been doing intervals of 30 to 50 mi minute EMOMs of just strict and machine. So super monotonous. Yeah. Yeah. Flow. Yeah. Yeah. And like that, yeah, that floor raises for everybody, um, everybody differently, but, but the point of, of the whole discussion is like, if you continue to become a better athlete, like Logan was saying, your consistency improves inside of competitions and that's just going to lead to you being in the hunt inside of whatever level you're at. So being okay with, you know, if you are trying to be competitive, like sometimes you're going to have to do things that you don't like. Um, and if the more things you don't do that you don't like, the better athlete you're going to become. And just keeping that inside of your mindset um, and inside of your, uh, you know, train of thought, during your your shitty and boring sessions or just sessions you don't want to do is is really gonna help you in the long run um i think when when logan and i started we basically did like a year of aerobic base building um and he can probably tell you how unfun that was <laughs> but Definitely. you know <laughs> a year two years down the road he's like this you know he's seen exponential growth inside of the open um and a lot of that was because we just we built a very big base to start and then we were planning for long term. Um, and his floor was kind of that aerobic and that base building period. And we had to push that up to get him better at um, for the sport, which our sport for the most part is competing in person. Um, definitely have to get there, but for the most part is competing in person. So um, the other, uh, the other point here, um, or do you guys have anything to add to that or any thoughts? I think on you got it. Cool. Um, yeah, like the, the next point um, that, they, that they made was uh, clutch performances are a decision. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. I think that actually has um, a lot of carryover into um, training as well. It's like, uh, you know, your, your performance on the floor is definitely your decision, but your performance to, you know, put an effort into training so that you do have great performances out on the floor is also your decision. Like if a weight's feeling heavy that day, you can either choose to, you know, walk away from the bar or you can choose to kind of push into that feeling and see what your body is capable of that day. 
sometimes that means you definitely need to take a break. But other times, you know, if you're hitting, um, if you're in a period where you know you should be like kind of overreaching or overloading the system a little bit more, that might mean pushing, um, pushing that barbell a little bit, a little bit more and seeing like, okay, you know, this, uh, 320 back squat felt a little heavy. I'm going to just throw 325 on, see how that feels. So I hit that. Okay. Let's see how 330 feels for this next set. And just kind of, or like, you know, doing your intervals and you hit, uh, three minutes on one and trying to push it down to 258 the next and 256 and just continually like making that decision to just go a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, despite whatever is going on around you. Um, and that applies to competition as well. You know, you have the crowd noise, you have the competitors around you, like you still have to make the decision to complete the workout, just like however you're feeling inside of training, like you have to make the decision to put forth the effort in training. So I thought that one had some cool carryover into training and, and, and competing as well. Um, but yeah, do you guys have any thoughts on that one? I, uh, I think it gets a little bit at the angle of like, the, there's a big, big difference between practice and deliberate practice. Like yeah. just going through the motions versus having that intention, having, all right, I, I'm attacking this on this set. Okay, I'm going to try and get this out of this set. Just picking one thing and hitting and getting that specific benefit or trying to get that yeah. and, and, and having a reason for doing everything. Maybe it's, you're working on, you're doing intervals of chest to bar pull-ups and you're just playing with, okay, what angle in the ceiling do I need to look at to have the most efficient kip? And it's just, it's the little minute details and you hit them again and again. And that's, that's what builds that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like a student of the sport almost. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. like if you look at a lot of, if, if you look, I like using basketball as an example because those individual like an individual player in basketball can take over the game exponentially more than any other sport uh in my opinion it's probably debatable uh, <laughs> uh but if you look at uh you know some of the greats in the sport michael jordan kobe bryant um i don't believe lebron james is one of the greatest in the sports controversial whatever <laughs> <laughs> but kobe bryant lebron james for sure uh or uh, sorry michael jordan for sure were some of the best um at just being able to um analyze the game and analyze their performance inside the game and, and pick apart little details um if you guys watch the last dance documentary um or actually, if you watch Kobe Bryant's funeral, um, Michael Jordan's speech on Kobe Bryant, like Kobe Bryant was constantly asking Michael questions or constantly asking questions. Like Michael said, he'd get texts from him at two or three in the morning asking about what he was thinking when he performed a, you know, turnaround fadeaway in college or whatever it was. So like just being so curious and trying to learn more and refine your technique is something um, you have to do as a competitor. And and going back and watching your videos and analyzing your videos and being like, oh, okay, like the dumbbell angle wasn't correct there on my, uh, you know, devil's presses or like I brought the, the dumbbell down, awkward, you know, differently on that rep, but it felt better. Like, how do I mimic that? Um, or like my bar path on my snatches in this rep felt a lot better. This set was a lot better on my snatch and just analyzing those little things of the sport um, is going to help you to achieve whatever ability level um, you want to achieve or whatever your goals is, is going to help you maximize your potential, um, inside the sport. Um, and I think like, yeah. yeah, just being a student, student of the sport is, is so important for, for every ability yeah. level. Yeah. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that Logan or? Yeah, man. I think just, you know, clutch performances are a choice, but that means to me, I would say, um, you know, I think winners attack situations and winners attack workouts and then make the choice, like, I am going to win this or I'm going to hit this weight or I'm going to do this I'm, and I'm going to do my very best to try to beat the people next to me um, and I'm going to give it my all. I think people that kind of wait for workouts or, you know, uh, situations to come to them, those are the people that – are not good at clutch performances. And, you know, every like team event or, um, you know, max event that I've done with like a teammate or anything like that, I'm, you know, I'm always like, if you think you can hit a, you know, a PR, if you think you can hit that weight, then freaking do it. Like, I don't have any problem with you missing a weight or whatever like that. But like, 
you know, this is why we're here, you know, like this is why we train. Like we want that extra stimulus to try to hit that PR, or, you know, try to do something that, you know, we didn't think that we could do. And, you know, I just remember it was, uh, it was probably the most fun event that I've ever done, but it was the overhead uh, lunge workout at Wadapalooza. And we, we came out and absolutely smoked the first heat. And I think we might've gotten like third overall. And yeah. it was like a elimination style. And we were at the second, the second round was even heavier. And like, I, you know, that was probably by far just like the craziest environment that I had ever competed in. Yeah. Um, that was in <laughs> yeah. In CrossFit. And I like turned to one of my teammates, Carrie, and I was like, this is why we train. Like this is <laughs> freaking nuts. And yeah. I think like we made the choice and, you know, I remember, uh, my teammate Grant went first and he had the lighter of the heavier barbells. And, you know, he was like, I'm going to get halfway and then drop it. But he actually almost ended up making it all the way down there um, and actually dropped it the same place I did. But, like, there was other people that, like, you know, um, barely could do a lunge at the heaviest weight or even the first weight. Um, so, yeah, it's just really cool to make the conscious efforts like, hey, we're in this. Um, you know, we're not here uh, just to keep up. But, you know, this workout – um, or, you know, this event is ours and we just got to go out there and take it. And I think that's, that's when you have, you know, clutch performances and yeah. competitors are those that are able to put themselves in that situation and, uh, come out on top. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, so it's not I, like, it's not necessarily a fear of, of fail. They kind of touched on like how bad losing feel, feels. And it's like, right. it's not necessarily like a, a fear of failure that you have at that point yeah. in time it's just like a and a, a fear of losing almost and like not yeah. wanting to feel that negative emotion of of what a loss truly feels like yeah. um so you almost like put yourself in this psyched up like overdrive moment where you're like i want the other person to feel like shit after this event i don't want to feel yeah. like shit after this event yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, you just exactly. go there and you just like smash it <laughs> yeah but, yeah yeah, yeah. You guys did an excellent job of, like, just – that was a fun event to watch. Yeah, it was, man. That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, there's a, a book called Relentless by Tim Grover, who is um, Michael Jordan's um, strength and conditioning coach, actually, in the in the 90s. And he talks about um, coolers, closers, and cleaners. Um, and uh, coolers, like a guy that's kind of, like, you know, buddy, buddy, he's got the ability levels or, or female, whatever, uh, but buddy, buddy, um, they just, they have the ability levels, but like they need somebody else to kind of pull them along, pull them along and, and, and get them to perform to their, like, maybe not to their best of potential, but to get them to perform. And then he talks about closers where, you know, if the situation arises, like, um, you know, they'll be able to step up and, and take the shot or put or you know, close out the situation. But, um, then he talks about cleaners who they're uh, he calls them cleaners because janitors were always the last individuals in the building, um, they're always cleaning the place, and, and cleaner mentality is to always be the last person in the building. But they go and they seek out those situations, they look for those situations to put themselves into, and I think that's kind of like the same aspect of like putting yourself into those situations and looking for those situations so that you can, you know, you can almost control the situation if you're putting yourself into it rather than sitting back, like you were saying, Logan, and just letting the situation come yeah. to you. Um, I think it's like a huge, huge component of, um, you know, that of the clutch performance or just performance in general is just is going in and taking the situation versus yep. letting it come to you for sure. Did yeah. you have a, you, how would you, guys describe like the switch that flips when you go into into compete like do you guys have it flip at a certain point too uh yeah like like going into competition yeah like when does it start to like uh like flip for you like walking out to the floor is it well before that like uh for me i've always been someone that like flips it like literally a minute before i'm about to go out Cause if I do it any sooner then I'm just going to get too hyped and then be too tired when I go out there. Cause like, I have to be very, very calm. And then right before, like, that's when you just turn it up. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. About you? And I'll, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and I would say if I get also, uh, depending on the de event and if it's a team or individual event, uh, sometimes if I get, if, you know, you kind of get too hyped up for it, you kind of forget your strategy and communication and stuff. So there's like a more calm, cool collective and, it, you know, just depends on the event. But yeah, I would yeah. say, you know, a minute before the event starts. Yeah. How do you, how do you flip your switch? Uh, I, I would oh, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Um, I, for, for me, I'd say it's more of a dimmer switch, dimmer uh, dial than a switch. So it's um, me going like deep, deep into my CNS of like, all right, I, I'm going to will everything that I have and just start just slowly getting ready and knowing that I'm going to bring every fiber of my being into what I'm about to do. And it just, it takes a little time to, to kind of dig deep in, into my mind to, to go there. <laughs> yeah. So yours is almost like a, a slow, like if you were to look at it like a graph, like it would be kind of like a slow, gradual uphill versus like a instantaneous switch and spike type thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's slow. And I, I think of it, of it more as a downhill. Cause I think I'm like going like down, down deep into my brain of like, all right, doesn't matter. I'm bringing it. Interesting. Okay. And I'm going, I'm going to use as much of my brain as I got to fight with every ounce that I got. Yeah. And doesn't, and put anything that's going on out of my mind. And it's just me trying to get my body to do whatever the hell I want it to do. Yeah. Yeah. So your focus is more so starting to take pieces away from what's your like external focus and starting to yeah, kind of like yeah. take pieces away. Take out then, the outside, the external yeah. stimulus and, and go internal. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess for, for, I, this is like one of the hardest things for, for people to do is to be able to, uh, to flip a switch and just only focus on task at hand, um, which is, you know, what CrossFit is all about. Like you have your set reps, you have your set movements and you just kind of go out there and, and, and do them. Um, but you know, there is crowd noise. What are other people going to think of me? All these other kind of like external, uh, stimuli coming in. Um, so I think flipping the switch is, is one of the hardest things to do for, for athletes. Um, and I like, for me, it's just like, as soon as you walk out onto the floor, like, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> it's like a feeling you can't describe. I don't really yeah. know. It's just and like, and typically that, like you literally walk out on the floor and there's a 60 yeah. time, 60 second time. So like, that's, you know, yeah yeah where i get the 60 seconds from <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah yeah it's just like uh um like nothing else exists except for whatever you're supposed to be doing at that time and it's just like it's one of the most calming feelings in the world but it's also one of the like most exciting feelings in the world yeah you're you're about to go do something that's going to be really freaking hard you know yeah and like uh the the nervousness of that and the and the um, idea of you don't know what the outcome is, is going to be is, is pretty, um, pretty nerve wracking, but yeah. at the same time, like it's also a competition. So like, fuck the people in the lane to the left and ready. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I like kind of going back to like, uh, you don't, you want them to feel the, the pain of losing rather than yourself feeling that, that yeah. pain. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a tough one to like kind of, get people to buy into. I don't know if you guys have had any um, success really cultivating that, but I, I find that like uh, giving people some mantras and like um, getting them to focus on their mantra or like getting them to focus on what the task is at hand. Cause it's like, kind of like what you were talking about, Matt, like the external stimuli just kind of coming in coming in coming in and, and people's inability to shut, shut that out or push it away and just focus on what they're, what they're doing is, is, uh, difficult for them. So giving them a mantra to like focus on of um, as soon as that external stimuli starts to come back in is like change the channel, change the channel, change the channel and push it away, push it away, push it away. And then they just start to cultivate a focus back towards whatever, whatever it is they're, they're going to do out on the floor. Um, have you guys had any experience or cultivated, helped cultivate it like differently or? I think just for me, it's with athletes, 
you know, kind of getting uh, getting them to zone in for a competition or right when they go out there. I just always get them to focus on the things that they can control. Um, yeah. And for me, I always tell them, you know, effort and your execution um, are the are the biggest things that you can control. And then uh, you kind of give them like a, a few bullet points on their execution um, that for that specific workout. Um, and then just tell them to go have fun because like you can't think about everything or anything possibility that could happen or else you're going to get, um, you know, overwhelmed and not be confident. Um, and that's what I think true competitors are when they hit the floor is confident. Yeah. 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 That's a huge, uh, huge component of it. One, yep. uh, one thing like, I, uh, Oh yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think it's also a willingness to be vulnerable because yeah. willing to like know that you're giving everything you've got that takes away any excuses afterwards like oh yeah that that will that willingness to be like i don't care what's about to happen i know i'm going to give everything i have yeah that, that's a scary feeling and just, yeah, just to be scary. confident to be like <laughs> i'm going to give everything i have make this happen will this to happen and let the chips fall where they are yeah yeah but that's the only that's truly the only way to put up what you're what you're physiologically capable of because otherwise yeah, yeah, yeah. you can hold back just that and just that little bit uh there was yeah. a workout in 2017 that uh the top five teams in the workout were all separated by 0.2 seconds like <laughs> so like just that little bit like is enough to you know screw over a, a, a games per, well for the team that i was coaching it was a games performance so um yeah it's just like you you definitely have to be um, willing to go there and like, and you also have to be willing to be okay with that not being enough, <laughs> you know? So yeah. yeah, that's a great point, Matt. Um, but that also comes back to uh, kind of another point that they had talked about was uncomfortable truths um, and being kind of like open and real with yourself about your ab ability levels and kind of what you need to work on. Um, yep. And part of that is, you know, this, this kind of comes back to the training aspect of it um, or just learning from competition in general. Um, but like, you know, there's, I heard a story about, again, we'll bring it back to basketball, but like Kobe Bryant um, was getting hit on the wrist all the time uh, during uh, a game against LeBron and D Wade and the ref wasn't calling it. So he's like, after the game, he was like, fuck this. He, he was pissed. So he brought his trainer out on the floor and he had his trainer hit him in the wrist when he shot the ball uh, until he started making shots. And basic, and LeBron and D-Wade were like, well, he's on our home court doing this. Like, we can't have him show us up. And they were like, it was like midnight and he was still out there doing this shit and we left. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, like that and, but like, uh, you know, he was realistic with, with, Hey, I can't make a shot when I'm, you know, a little bit roughed up or, you know, somebody's hanging on me or hitting my wrist or I need, I need to get better at this certain aspect of the game. And like, you know, people don't like being told things that they're not good at. Uh, mm -hmm. But in order for us to get better, like we have to be okay with being told that we need to work on things and we need to get better um, at things. So that was, that was kind of my takeaway from, from that, um, that portion of their, or that kind of like statement. Um, do you guys have anything on that or? Yeah. you probably uh, just, or, Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Logan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You probably just hit on one of my like favorite topics just as far as like, uh, you know, what it takes to be successful, like in training. Um, and as far as, you know, being able to be reflective of yourself and just being super honest. Um, I can't remember who said it, but it said, uh, you know, a true man or woman is the one that is able to look at themselves the closest. And those that are successful are able to be like, okay, I need to work on this or, Hey, I failed because I was too lazy in this area or, you know, I didn't eat right or I didn't recover right. Or, you know, all these things that, 
maybe I had control of, I didn't do, and that's why I failed. Not because I didn't get the right call, not because it was my coach's fault, not because, you know, I was under, um, you know, under recovered because I got overworked on a workout or something like that. But it's, um, you know, taking just absolute responsibility for you and your own actions and, uh, you know, being able to take advice and being able to learn, um, I think are, you know, huge, huge proponents of that. And I think, you know, the cornerstone of that is just being super humble and being able to, you know, take advice, but take advice from the right people. Um, mm. Cause you know, I think a lot of people, it's easy to be like, Oh, I'll just listen to everyone. If that's what you mean. No, you know, you have to have discernment and know, you know, who to trust and whose word to trust. And, um, and, you know, I, one of my favorite, uh, I actually think, I can't remember who said it, but it was at a, um, it was at an open camp and um, I was talking about the open and they said that you have to earn the right to be disappointed. And what that basically means is like a lot of people like disappointed in their performance or how they did in the open or what competition. And it's like, how can you really be disappointed when you did all of this that you could have done better? Like you chose to not get sleep every other weekend or every other night. You chose to, um, you know, drink on the weekends or you chose, um, you know, not to do your mobility work or you chose to skip out on um, your aerobic work. And I, that always hits home for me. Um, and it's just like, man, you gotta, if you're, if you're trying to put, put forth your best effort, you got to close all the holes and, you know, control what you can control and learn where you can learn. Um, and I think, you know, that is a huge, huge key to, I think, long-term success in any, any aspect of life. Yeah. Matt, before you say something, can I, can I caveat off, off of that? Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, there's always stuff you could be doing more, but, it, it come, also comes back to the point of uh, uncomfortable truths. And like, if yeah. there are things you could really truly be doing more, you have to ask yourself the question of, do I really want to be doing those things or do yeah. I want to be doing something else? And if you want to be doing yeah. something, there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah, you also have fine. to understand that like, you're probably not going to reach, uh, like you're probably going to have more disappointments in your, in your sport um, or in whatever endeavor it is you're, um, chasing after and you're going to have to be real with that and maybe kind of adjust the frame work of what you are looking at goal wise um, or looking at accomplishing in the sport um, but I think like you know with that disappointment you, there always needs to be the question of is this what I really want that comes after that disappointment and if, if the answer yeah. is yes yeah. then you have to come back and look at like okay, what, what do I need to do to improve upon this performance so that I'm not feeling this disappointment again? And I think yeah, that's like yeah. something at the end of the season that's really awesome to kind of go back and take a look at um, and like, okay, you know, last year my nutrition sucked, so I'm going to clean that up. Or last yeah. year, you know, I was still going out and partying on the weekend, so we're going to yep. cut that out, you know, or like one yeah. time a month type thing. And like, it's yeah. always a it's always a process too. Like you're always evolving so it's like one you know one step at a time one process at a time like you can't just yep. throw the book at somebody and be like you need to eat fruits and vegetables if they've <laughs> for a fucking yeah. seven yeah. years you know um <laughs> but yeah i just wanted to like caveat off of that and like yeah and, and you know uncomfortable truths are always asking yourself why or asking somebody else their opinion why and making sure you have a relationship with them to be able that's comfortable enough for them to tell you something that's going to hurt and yeah. you be okay with them telling you that. Did you, Matt, you had something to say? Yeah. Yeah. So I, it, it's just, um, I think sim to, to oversimplify everything we just talked about, there was a lot of good stuff. Um, you can't fix a problem if you don't acknowledge that a problem's there. So it's that yeah. honest, brutal truth, whether it's from you looking closely or someone that you trust looking at it closely, you, you got to be honest with it and look at it in order to fix it. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Uh, what were, what were some other things uh, that kind of popped up into your head, Logan, or that you had kind of some thoughts on 
um, competitor's mindset? Um, man, as far as um, – and we put a lot of good things. I know. Um, but I would, end on the list of everything. <laughs> you know, I would say, um, you know, my, like you just – just to caveat what you said, like if you really want it, that's when you really need to – um, be reflective and you know that also starts with you know cultivating your why and um, you know closing like like you said like if you don't want it or maybe you don't want to dedicate that much of your life to it like that's fine but yeah. just know like if you're going after that goal there's someone else out there that is probably more willing to sacrifice the things that you aren't you know yeah. there's someone else out there like sure balance is balance is great Okay, but there's someone else out there that you're competing against that doesn't need balance. And they're just yeah. obsessed with going after a goal and achieving it. And I think, like you said, like, it's fine. Like, if you if you want to, you know, go after your goals that way, or maybe it's not as important to you. Um, but, you know, just know that if you're, um, if you're fully bought into it, um, being reflective on how you can improve is... Um, you know, how you're ultimately going to improve over a long period of time. And yeah. you might not ever get the goals that you set out for, but you're, you're going to get dang close. And, you know, along the way, you're going to become a better person and athlete for, for it. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to kind of re go back on something I said, but uh, yeah. when I, when I was talking about if, if you're not willing to, um, you know, do the things necessary to come, to come, um, you know, complete that goal and you have to be okay with being disappointed more. You, you have to be okay with being disappointed more, or you might need to adjust the time frame in which you're looking to do something. Cause it might, yeah. you're not looking to, you know, continually change and evolve as a, and put in new efforts or, you know, change practices that are deterring from that goal. You might still be able to achieve that goal or you might still be able to achieve great performance. Um, but it also might look on a different timeline as well. Um, yeah. so, you know, if your goal was to qualify for the games the next year, qualify for X competition the next year, um, and you realize that certain aspects of your life are taking away from that, it might be now a three-year goal versus a one-year goal that you guys, are, that you're looking at. And there might be yeah. some more limits along the way, but, um, you know, it's definitely not impossible, like, especially if you're still seeing progress, but yeah. like truly like it, it, to be to be truly great and to be a truly great competitor, you have to, um, you know, look at adjusting what it is that is taking you away from your competition, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on anything else, Matt, or? Um, I just, I just want to throw in like, so like we're, we're kind of, I, I also like to quote, um, like if you want to be world-class prepare to be un unrelatable. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it's going to be obsessive. It's, <laughs> it's not going to be balanced. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and, but at the same time, like, if you don't want that, that's perfectly fine. Like, yeah. just yeah. be honest with what your goals For actually sure. are. Like, you can have a fantastic life. You can be really, really freaking fit. You can have fun doing competitions yeah. and have yeah. life balance. Yeah. But yeah. Just understand how all that plays together. Yeah. 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 And, that, and that kind of goes back to like, there's different levels of, of competition and like, you have to be like, to be truly great. Yeah. You have to be like a fucking, you have to be a psycho. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like you can, there's still characteristics of, you know, every level of, of competition that you're competing at that you can elicit to be a competitor. Like you don't just have to be great at something to be a good competitor. Like there's still, you know, a lot of what we talked about being in the hunt, uh, your ability to focus, um, you know, training to raise your floor, all things that you can do to be a better competitor when you step out onto the floor. Um, yeah. So yeah, to be like, to be truly great at something, like you said, Matt, like you have to be unrelatable, but, at the same time, like there's different levels to competition yeah. as well. So well, I, I think, think so, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, yeah, just to go off what Matt was saying, I think there's so many people that um, whether, whether, whether or not they realize it or maybe they just, they haven't seen someone actually live it out. Um, but there's so many people that, you know, they want to compete or be at that top 1%, but 
then they also want to live like the rest of the 99%. You know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it, just, sure. it, it just doesn't happen. And like sometimes, sometimes it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know. You know, you don't yeah. know that it's, um, it's normal for an elite athlete to never drink alcohol. You don't know, you don't know that right. it's, you know, normal for an ath uh, elite athlete to have maybe one or two cheat meals a month, you know? So yeah. it's like, um, so yeah, sometimes it's just like, you don't know what you don't know, but then sometimes it's just, uh, just need to be maybe a little bit more reflective, um, in your choices, but yeah, yeah. That, uh, that obsession factor is something that's really hard for people to relate relate with like yeah it is. Today's age of instagram like people yeah. don't understand like you know yeah so and so going out on a boat is like on their rest day and they're out there for three hours maybe yeah. so that they can come back and go get a bunch of fucking body work done afterwards yeah you know? yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they're they're three hours of instagram stories out on their boat like that's like yeah. their that's like their so quote unquote you know relaxation period for the week yeah. and then the rest of their exactly. social social environment is all in the gym like yeah and then they come, they come home like they eat their food and then they go back to the gym the next day you know yeah like there's, yep. there's an obsession factor that i think people have a tough time relating to because they they see these glamorous things on you know social media and they're like oh i can be you know great at this and still enjoy myself like doing yeah. other things it's like ah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> But, um, yeah, uh, you guys have any other thoughts on anything or? I think we hit it all, man, for me. Maybe wrap it up. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, well, hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys had some good takeaways from that one. Um, we'll be doing another podcast in probably a couple weeks here with all of us on it. Um, as always, uh, if you guys are listening on um, what the iTunes, if you guys are listening on iTunes, head over to um, Instagram, follow us on Instagram, blacklisted.hq. Um, if you guys are looking for some different YouTube series we're putting out, um, we're doing some workout breakdowns with some of our athletes. Um, so if you guys head over to YouTube, just blacklisted HQ on YouTube and subscribe to us on YouTube, we'll, we're going to start putting out some more of those, um, as well as we put out some, uh, movement content every once in a while. Um, so give us a follow on there. Um, if you guys are looking for coaching you can just head, uh, hit us up in DMS or, um, or uh, head over to our website and hit the contact us button. Um, we'll be able to set you up with uh, one of us as a coach. So uh, thanks for, thanks for taking the time guys. Um, you have any parting, parting thoughts or sage advice, I guess. I don't know. Get after it this week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just happy yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right on. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, hope you guys have a good rest of your day or week whenever you guys are listening, and we will catch you next time. Oh.